Hi guys. This manhwa is called Author of My Own Destiny. Enjoy watching. Fiona Green is an illegitimate child of a count who had a difficult life. She did, however, show a talent for magic as she grew, eventually becoming a well-known magician. She was your standard heroine, but Fiona will never be the heroine. Fiona's father called her when she was eating at Count Green's residence. Fiona suddenly came to her senses and apologized to her father, while the eldest son mocks her. They all treat her badly in their home since she is an illegitimate child. Fiona is only 13 years old. A helpless, illegitimate daughter who's a thorn in everyone's side. The current Fiona can't believe she's been reincarnated as one of her own novel's characters. This is not beneficial for the current Fiona because she is not the heroine but the Empire's worst enemy later on. Furthermore, she is doomed to die an epic death as a result of the hero and heroine's love power. The novel is a love story about an emperor and a female saint who save the world. Fiona, the novel's villain, puts the main pair in jeopardy when she nearly achieves immortality. Fiona was defeated at the end of the novel, and her soul was sent into darkness, where she suffered for all eternity. That is Fiona's fate, and thus the possible future of the current Fiona. While thinking about this, Fiona's father mentions how bad the situation on the battlefield is. As a result, the emperor directed that a magician from their household be sent to the northern front lines. Hearing this, Fiona remembered the novel she authored, in which the original story begins in six years and the empire has been significantly weakened due to battles with demonic monsters. Her father informed them that because the emperor had asked for a magician from their family, one of them would have to travel to the northern battlefield. Hearing this, the count's children were all taken aback. It is appropriate for the emperor to request a magician from their family because House Green is known throughout the empire as a family of mages. Fiona was pushed to volunteer in their place by the family's eldest son. Their father was overjoyed that Fiona volunteered as if they were trying to kick her out of the house. Fiona wishes to retaliate but she believes she has no choice but to accept their treatment of her. Maids don't look after her, no one in their house cares for her and she's always alone and locked up in the attic. Her family had always mistreated her because she was a bastard kid. So she simply agreed to go to battle in the north. Fiona was upset deep inside and wondered if the original Fiona felt the same way, but unlike the original. The current Fiona didn't despise everyone since they were her creation. Fiona arrives on the northern front lines to meet Duke Halon at Halon Castle. As Fiona entered the room where the Duke was, he already criticized her for being the child brought to help them. Fiona was already aware of the Duke's fierce attitude and will be the master of the male lead in the future. The Duke was enraged because Count Green sent a tiny little girl, and it appears that the Count is looking down on the Duke. The Duke declares that after the battle is done, he will annihilate the House Green. He approaches Fiona and asks her to explain why she was sent there rather than an adult. Fiona expressed the same reason that her siblings had given her. The family name will be carried on by the eldest son, her sister will marry soon. And the second son will be engaged soon. The Duke believes that the Count does not take the war seriously and has ordered Fiona to return home since they do not need children at war. Fiona has nowhere to go and because she knows how to utilize magic, unlike the last Fiona, she can persuade the Duke. She called the Duke before he left. She requested that he allow her to prove herself and allow her to stay in his home. Fiona thought that it would be better to make a reputation for herself in Halon than to be thrown out onto the streets and wait for the male lead to appear. The Duke was perplexed as to what a kid like her could do. But Fiona insisted on fighting alongside them as a mage on the battlefield and proving to them that she could assist them in winning the war. The Duke was surprised to hear this, and Fiona, despite her bravery in speaking those things, was terrified within. The Duke smiled and told Fiona that he agrees to allow her to prove herself after some thought. Jiron, the Duke's assistant, returns to the Duke after seeing Fiona in her chamber and they discuss Fiona. 
Jaron asked the duke if he would allow the child to fight on the battlefield. And the duke said yes, because Fiona volunteered. Jaron was even told by the duke that she would be sent to the second rampart. Jaron was taken aback since the second rampart is crawling with demonic monsters and is the most dangerous spot on the front lines. However, the duke assures his assistant that he will also be traveling there with Fiona, so there is no need to fear. However, the duke also informs Jaron that if Fiona proves to be useless, he will let her become monster food. Before they leave for the second rampart, the duke reminds Fiona that the time has come for her to prove her value and that she has no one to protect her. The duke also asked Fiona if she was afraid, to which Fiona replied that she is not afraid to die. A battlefield is a better place to die than the palace where she died in her previous existence. When they arrived at the second rampart, soldiers started yelling that demon monsters were attacking. It's a good time for displaying Fiona's strength. Fiona runs to the top of the wall to see how the battlefield looks. She was taken aback when she saw it since it is far worse than she described in her story. She could hear army screams from here and there and described it as terrifying. Fiona felt guilty. After all, she is the one responsible for what she sees in front of her eyes because she wrote it. When the duke saw her expression, he told her she could turn around and leave, but Fiona reminded herself that she was the one who caused this problem, therefore she needed to accept responsibility. She informed the duke that she would not be leaving and began to use her magic to aid in the fight against the monsters. She can feel the mana pouring as soon as she concentrates and has faith in Fiona's abilities. The duke noticed some clouds developing in the sky as if a storm was on its way. Then Fiona began to strike all of the monsters on the battlefield with thunders. After witnessing such incredible magical ability, all soldiers, including the duke, were in awe. Fiona, on the other hand, felt relieved since she had accomplished her goal. The duke carries Fiona while informing her that he has never seen such a great mage before. He then walks to the side of the wall, Fiona in his hand, to show her that the remaining monsters are fleeing. Fiona was happy to see the demons fleeing because it was her first accomplishment in this world. She realized that the soldiers below were staring at her, so she waved to them while being carried in the duke's arms. The troops all chanted Fiona's name, thanking her for saving their lives. Fiona asked the duke about her status as an assisting mage in this war. Fiona was overjoyed when the duke brushed her head and smiled as he welcomed her to Halon. A month later, Fiona received everything from the servants and was dubbed the young genius mage. Because there are no other children in the palace, everyone, including the duke, adores her. Fiona came across Jaron while coming down the corridor and asked him where he was going. Jaron said that he would go to the fourth rampart since a monster had appeared there. In comparison to the second rampart, where Fiona stood guard, the other ramparts are in poor condition. Fiona can't believe these attacks happened before the beginning of her novel's original story. Where the male lead appears. Fiona agrees to accompany him, but Jaron is hesitant because she witnessed Fiona's fear when she saw the dead monsters up close, and she has been following the duke since then. Jaron said to Fiona that he would bring her if she promised not to inform the duke since the duke does not want anyone to impose on her. Fiona quickly agreed to Jaron's condition. When they arrived at the fourth rampart, a soldier quickly reported the condition on Jaron. While Fiona surveyed the area, Fiona has grown accustomed to the awful war scenes and is unable to remain still while watching, so she volunteers to assist the soldiers in burning the bodies. She burned the bodies of the monsters one after the other till she came upon a body of a small child resting down among the others. Looking at the young lad, she believes he is approximately her age and is most likely a mercenary based on the clothes he is wearing. Fiona was praying for the boy's presumed corpse when he unexpectedly moved, startling her. She quickly came to her senses and shifted the other bodies that were weighing the child's body. She saw his abdominal wound and assisted his body in lying down on his back when the kid abruptly opened his eyes. The boy soon asked Fiona who she was, 
and Fiona was taken aback by his attractive face. Fiona has never seen him before, yet for some reason. She somewhat feels familiar with him. A monster appeared on Fiona's back while she was thinking hard about who the boy could be. The troops were informed and notified Fiona that the monster was about to attack. When Fiona didn't respond soon enough to the surprise attack. The young child grabbed her hand and saved her. The soldiers are ready for attack because a monster has survived. Fiona was aware that the monster was aiming for her, and she would have killed if it hadn't been for the young kid grabbing her. Fiona is at a loss for ideas now that the child's wound has worsened and she is unable to move his body. The monster is preparing to strike again, and Fiona has no choice but to confront the gigantic monster head-on. She used a lot of magic to defeat that huge monster. So she felt pain in her head, but when she looked at the young boy's body, the suffering she felt was nothing. When Fiona was about to help the kid, she suddenly realized who he was by looking at him again. Judging by his clothes, hair color, eyes, and beautiful face. She knew he was the male lead of her story, Sigrin. Fiona was perplexed as to why the male lead had already appeared when it was supposed to appear in six years. She understood it was not the time to worry about anything else because her objective was to save him first, because if she didn't, the world would end as there was no hero in it. Two days later, the doctor informed Fiona that Sigrun's injuries were severe, but that he would recover quickly. Fiona was relieved because she had prevented the end of the world. While looking at Sigrun, Fiona remembered that she had only written a few short phrases regarding Sigrun's past in her novel. In the original novel, she didn't give any precise details. Sigrun, like most male protagonists, had a secret about his birth and the fact that he was an imperial prince. He was, in fact, the emperor's illegitimate child. Sigrun's mother was a weak commoner, and her son, Sigrun, was viewed as a thorn by others who wanted him dead. Sigrun had feared for his life since he was a child, which is why his mother attempted to go to another country to protect her son. Sigrun's mother hid her son in bushes as they were on the run from individuals who wanted Sigrun dead. His mother, on the other hand, was caught and died. Sigrun, who was alone in this world, escaped to Halon in the north. That's how Sigrun met Duke Abel, who recognized Sigrun as his mentor due to Sigrun's skill with a sword. That was Sigrun's childhood story in summary. It was quite normal to have a terrible childhood story in any fantasy novel, but Fiona was saddened on the inside thinking about how Sigrun had experienced those events. While Sigrun was still sleeping, Fiona took a nap at the bedside. When she woke up, she noticed Sigrun staring at her with wide open eyes. Sigrun asked Fiona a few questions and exchanged names while staring at her. Sigrun was perplexed as to how he was still alive after that. Hearing this, Fiona assumed he had forgotten about the time he saved her from the monster. She told Sigrun that she would summon a doctor and get him examined. Sigrun was astonished to hear it, and Fiona reasoned that his health was more important. He may be the male protagonist. But he is still a child, and her fantasy of him has proven to be far from reality. Fiona felt horrible seeing Sigrun in such pain. Sigrun pushed her hands away as she was about to touch his head to see whether he had a fever. Fiona was being gentle with him. But Sigrun was becoming increasingly irritated, so Fiona poked his injuries to get him to stop complaining. Sigrun was simply being cautious about her because they were strangers to each other. Fiona expressed her gratitude to him for saving her life. Duke Abel enters the room as Sigrun is saying that he doesn't recall saving her. The Duke told them both that Fiona was still too young to bring men home. Fiona knew the Duke was upset, so she did not retaliate further, instead, she explained that Sigrun was gravely injured. Which is why she brought him home and had him treated. Duke Abel inquired about Sigrun's origins, saying that he did not appear to be from Duke's territory. Fiona couldn't answer the question because she never thought about where Sigrun was from when she was writing the story. Sigrun responded to the Duke by saying he was with the Karl mercenaries. The Duke asked him if mercenaries often hire children like him. 
Fiona revealed to Sigrun that he is Duke Abel Halon. After hearing that, Sigrun went into deep thought about whether the Duke would try to kill him. Fiona teased Sigrun to get him to stop thinking. When Fiona is having fun pestering Sigrun, the Duke lifts her and tells her that she is too young to be messing around with boys. Fiona saw that the Duke has taken to embracing her in his arms unfrequently. Leading everyone to believe that he is her father. She abruptly asked the Duke if Sigrun could stay in his castle until he recovered. Because this is the first time Fiona has requested the Duke for something, the Duke decides to let Sigrun stay and gives him room to recover. Fiona was surprised that the Duke is also providing him with a room. The Duke informed Fiona that he is giving the small kid his own room so that the two of them do not sleep in the same room. After hearing that, Sigrun embarrassed and raged at Fiona. Stating she was spoiled to the point of being ignorant. Fiona expressed gratitude to the Duke for agreeing to her request. She has also noticed that the Duke has grown nicer with her, but she is still unsure if he likes her or not. Sigrun remembered her mother's final words before falling asleep. Her mother told him he had to survive, so he went north. He had to worry about finding food after he was out of immediate danger. Later, he joined a band of mercenaries and worked in menial labor. As a result, he didn't have to starve to death. But the mercenaries beat him up for no reason, and his body was covered with scars. He needed to survive, so he endured the beating for a time and over, to the point where he questioned why he needed to survive. After a while, the Karl mercenaries from which Sigrun belongs were hired to protect Halon. It was a dangerous task fighting demonic monsters, but it paid a great deal, so Sigrun agreed to join them. Sigrun was not provided with a decent weapon. So he had to come up with someone else's sword that he picked up on the battlefield. Fighting a demonic monster was dangerous, but it made Sigrun significantly stronger. But then the unavoidable occurred. When the monsters close in, one of the soldiers pushes Sigrun towards the beasts, telling him that he is a great sacrifice for them. Sigrun was completely stunned, but a loud voice in his head told him that he needed to survive, so he tried everything he could to fight the monsters that surrounded him. But no matter how strong he grew, it wasn't enough. He was badly injured and collapsed on the ground. While on the verge of dying, Sigrun regrets one thing he's dying because of the rude soldier who pushes him. He didn't want to die because of that guy, he wanted to die for someone in similar situations. Nobody helped him in his darkest hours, so he at least wanted to be there for someone else. When he opened his eyes, he was unsure where he was and found Fiona sleeping at the bedside. Looking at the sleeping Fiona, he believed it was the most peaceful scene he had ever seen in his life. Fiona and Sigrun were eating when Fiona asked to inspect Sigrun's wound to see how it was, but he was still uncomfortable with her. Sigrun thought Fiona was odd and asked her if she was worried about him out of pity. Fiona realized Sigrun regards her as a young noble lady who knows little about the real world and is a distant young relative of the Duke, which is why he is irritated that he has to rely on a girl like her. Fiona said, it's not out of pity, and she just wanted to save him. They argued a little more after that when the physician arrived to check on Sigrun. Sigrun told Fiona to leave the room because his bandages needed to be redone. Fiona assumed he was simply embarrassed to undress in front of her. But Sigrun doesn't want Fiona to see all the scars on his body. Fiona didn't imagine it would take that long to replace the bandages, so she sat patiently outside the door. While waiting, Fiona pondered several things including why Sigrun despised her so much and how she couldn't figure out Sigrun because she hadn't given any care to his childhood personality in her novel. She merely wants to be friends with him because of her guilt, affection, and little calculated things, but on Sigrun's side. Fiona is being kind to him for no reason, which he finds suspicious, so if she gets too close, he might hate her even more, compromising her future. While Fiona was lost in attention, the physician was finished and about to leave when he noticed Fiona sitting in front of the door. Fiona inquired of the physician about Sigrun's injury. The doctor informed her that his wounds are improving well, 
but he is more concerned about his bodily scars. He also advised Fiona not to bring Segrin back to the mercenaries because his body is covered in old scars. Fiona ran inside to Segrin after hearing this and feeling horrible about it. Fiona is desperate to see the scars on Segrin's body, so she forcefully opens his shirt and lifts it. Segrin was enraged by what Fiona had done and pushed her to the ground. He was taken aback when Fiona landed because she was so light when he pushed her. Segrin noticed Fiona crying when he tried to help her up. This startled him, so he asked Fiona if she had been hurt someplace. He's worried about her and wants to call the physician, but Fiona stops him. Fiona assured Segrin that she is all right. She's crying because those wounds aren't just from his battles, but also from being burned and beaten mercilessly. They occurred as a result of repeated acts of malice. Fiona inquired as to where he got those scars, but Segrin remained silent. He just told her that's why he wants Fiona out when the bandages on his wounds need to be replaced so she doesn't see the scars. Fiona suddenly hugged Segrin and asked him how that happened while he was still speaking. Segrin had just informed her that many mercenaries are thugs and that being the youngest and weakest makes him an easy target. Fiona felt guilty. Not pity, because she had never really realized what it was like for Segrin until now. She's partly to blame for the brutality he's been suffering all this time. Fiona promised herself that she would not leave Segrin even if he despised her. That's the least she can do for all of his permanent scars. She also apologized to him and promised never to hurt him. Even though his emotional traumas will not be quickly healed, she promised herself that she would protect Segrin until he met the female protagonist. So she asked Segrin to be her friend. Fiona and Segrin have grown pretty close after that event. Fiona was also overprotective about Segrin, saying that even though he's nearly recovered, she doesn't want him to roam around. Fiona advised him to listen to her because she was the oldest among them. However, Segrin informed her that he is a year older than she is and that she is small for her age. Fiona knows this since Duke Abel told her she's smaller for a 13-year-old. That's also why Fiona can't use her magic for long periods of time. She is physically weak. They were talking enthusiastically about stuff when Geron burst into the room. He informed Fiona that a massive wave of monsters was approaching the second rampart and that they needed all of their forces immediately once, including Fiona. She responded promptly that she would be there, but Segrin grabbed her and asked her why she would go there. Fiona hadn't told Segrin that she was a mage fighting in this war, so she told her that she was an enlisted mage whose major role was to protect the second rampart. Segrin is shocked by what he hears from her and yells at her that the second rampart is the most dangerous of them. He went on to say that even mercenaries and knights who had spent their entire lives on the battlefield had died the moment they set foot there, so how could a tiny girl like her guard such a spot? He also told Geron that they were insane to put a small kid like Fiona in such a dangerous location. Fiona understands Segrin's rage because she is the one who gave him the character to seek justice, thus he feels awful that a small girl has to go to the battlefield. Fiona assured Segrin that everything is all right. Segrin became enraged upon hearing this and questioned if she was not worried at all. Fiona responded by informing him that she had nowhere else to stay and that she needed to do her part. Halon needed a mage. And she needed a place to stay, so they are assisting each other. Fiona reassures Segrin that there is nothing to be upset about. After all, she chose to stay in Halon, so there's no reason to blame anyone for sending her to the battlefield. Segrin then inquired about her family. To which Fiona said that she is an illegitimate child and that her family was the one who sent her to Halon to get rid of her in their home. Segrin's face was shocked because he knows how it feels to be a child alone on the battlefield and that one must pay a price to protect oneself. Fiona informed Segrin that it was her choice, therefore he shouldn't worry about her, and that if she died on the battlefield, it was because she wasn't competent enough to survive. Before Fiona leaves, she reminds Segrin not to move too quickly so that his wounds don't reopen. And also not to skip meals. 
Seekrin asked Fiona why she was so concerned about him, and her response was simple, he was hurt. When Fiona left the room, she noticed the Duke waiting for her outside. The Duke is mad, therefore he must have overheard them talking. He was about to say something to Fiona when he stopped himself. He simply scoops her up on his arm and reminds Fiona not to leave his side when they arrive at the battlefield. They successfully defended the second rampart that day, and their peaceful days continued. Fiona and Sigrun became even closer, and Sigrun stopped being harsh to Fiona after discovering she was a mage. Sigrun's wounds had already healed entirely, thus there was no reason for him to remain at Helion Castle. Fiona, on the other hand, does not want Sigrun to return to the fourth rampart since the mercenaries who beat him will still be there. While Fiona was contemplating what she could do to Sigrun, a maid called for her to inform her that the Duke wanted to speak with her. Before entering the Duke's office, the little girl contemplated what the Duke would discuss. She assumed it was about trusting her or her abilities since they always fought together. Duke Abel told her that he was informed by the doctor that the boy she had saved had already recovered. Fiona was already aware of it and didn't want to kick out Sigrun immediately since the mercenaries who mistreated him were still not punished. The Duke added that he disliked the idea of bringing strangers to his castle, which Fiona was also aware of. After hearing that, it made the little girl anxious, while the Duke was smiling saying that maybe Fiona already knew the identity of Sigrun, so she led him into the castle. When Duke Abel inquired if she had already known their guest, Sigrun, before she brought him into this house, Fiona denied her awareness of his background. If the Duke had already checked the background of the strange boy, he must have discovered that he was an imperial prince. Perhaps, it would be suspicious for an illegitimate child of account to know about the secret of the imperial family, so acting dumb would be her best option. Fiona answered that she just knew the boy for being an orphan, who was doing menial work with the mercenaries. While explaining she noticed how the duke intently staring at her, which made her plead in her mind to believe her. Fortunately, the duke thought that the identity of the boy was not that necessary for her, based on her capability. He added that he could not read what she was thinking because sometimes she acted like her age, but sometimes, she was sterner and more level-headed than anyone. When Fiona claimed that she was just like the common girls, the Duke opposed her as he stated that she was undeniably a genius. Because of that special feature of hers, he was confused about whether he must keep her close or be distant from her due to reason that having an overwhelming power can be a double-edged sword. In the end, the duke decided to keep her as he thought of giving her an additional duty. Fiona took it as an assurance that there was nothing to worry about getting kicked out anymore. She was aware of the feud between Abel and the imperial family, so she understood why the duke was suspicious about how they sent him a little girl as a backup. Abel showed her a petition from the residents of the town near the fourth rampart. It indicated that the mercenaries were harassing the residents under his protection. When Fiona read the document, she was surprised to see that they were pertaining to the Karl mercenaries, which Sigrun was a member of. After reading it, the Duke declared that he would give her temporary authority to punish the perpetrators at the Fourth Rampart. He wanted her to teach them a lesson. Afterward, Halon would reward her ten times for her efforts as she made the enemies pay ten times for the inconvenience they had caused. As for Sigrun, she will be escorting him back to his place since he was already healed. They began traveling, Fiona was amused by the snow she saw outside the window of their carriage. When she saw a snowman, she invited Sigrun to make one. But he was just irritated about that thought which made Fiona inquire if he was still mad about how she kept that she was fighting in the battle. Seeing her sad reaction made Sigrun agree to make one with her if they had spare time since there was an order from the duke that she must fulfill first. It made her happy as she enthusiastically invited him to play once she finished her mission. In the back of his mind, Sigrun was wondering why the girl wanted to play with someone like him. In fact, he does not know how to have fun with the girls his age and he could not even afford to say kind words to her. Furthermore, he could not believe that Fiona was a mage. For him, Fiona was like a winter fairy from the fairy tale. Despite her unreal physical features that could even compare to a white rabbit hopping around the bed of snow, there was a dangerous responsibility beneath her. 
She is a mage who is guarding one of the most dangerous places on the battlefield, the second rampart. Because of it, he could not help but be enraged at the people who sent her away to this kind of place. Moreover, he was also mad at her for letting herself be involved in this situation. Fiona was even more concerned about him than herself. Her goodness to him made him wonder if the little girl was trying to be close to him because possessed an imperial blood who could be useful to her in the future. Even though he was not certain about it, he still wanted to trust her. However, there was a time that he could not, because he was afraid that she might betray him. Suddenly, Fiona asked about the set of rules for the mercenary. Sigrun answered that they have no rules, it is only a matter of survival of the fittest. They are weak against the stronger and strong against the weaker. In order to become an efficient mercenary, you must show the people the threat in you. His answer becomes helpful to Fiona in accomplishing her mission. She wanted to make sure that even the weakest in their group would clearly get her lesson. Sigrun wanted to know the order of the duke to make her inquire about how the mercenaries deal with each other. Suddenly, their carriage stopped, and they saw that they already arrived at the town of the fourth rampart. Fiona was about to jump off when Sigrun stopped her. He went out first and he offered his hand to be her support. He was worried that she might fall if she went out by herself given the height of the carriage from the ground. She was stunned by his action which made her laugh before accepting his hand. Fiona Green had become very kind and friendly to a stranger like him and he wanted to pay for the goodness she had for him by doing simple acts of kindness for her. Somehow, this kind of relationship he has with her makes him want to become a more kinder person. As soon as they got into the fourth rampart, she started doing her mission. She was dealing with a man as she showed her the letter that was stamped with the seal of the duke. But the man just insulted her because she was just a kid and urged her to go back home. She understands why she was receiving that treatment from them since no one knows her in that place. Fiona threatened him about the consequences he must face which made him become cooperative with her. The little girl introduced herself as Fiona Green, who was in charge of handling the unpleasant situation that was happening at the fourth rampart. When the man asked how he could help her, she ordered him three things. First, she needs the soldiers of their town to arrest the perpetrators. Then gather their residents at the town square. Lastly, she asked Sigrun about the precise location of the mercenaries so they would have a lead to arrest them. According to the boy, they usually hang out at the alehouse near the rampart wall. After they left the task to the people of the town, they decided to stroll away. While walking, Sigrun asked her once again about the duke's order to her. Fiona was still undecided about how she would punish the perpetrators. But based on the order of Abel, it seemed like he wished for something dreadful punishment. As for the boy beside her, who was only 14 years old, she thought of keeping that idea from him. So she just simply answered that she was assigned to watch the perpetrators and make a fair judgment. It might sound bad excuse, but it would not matter since Sigrun would not be tagging along. But when she asked him, the little boy answered that he was coming with her. He explained that he already experienced fighting in a battle. Besides, the scars she saw in him were already old. Sigrun assured her that he could fight well, and he wanted to protect her in case something happened. He was aware of how terrible the people in this place were, and it would be better if they dealt with it together. The people saw the two kids coming. They could not help but express their disappointment upon seeing the little girl as the deputy of the duke. While passing by the murmuring people, she was also wondering why Abel entrusted her with this mission when he could give it to Jiran instead. Even though he was suspecting her, he still had given her authority to handle this. She was thinking critically about how she would punish the mercenaries. It must be fairly enough to the consequences of their action because this will serve as a warning for other people. Those whosoever committed the same offenses would have the same punishment. As a result, this would improve the safety and security of the town. But if the punishment were too merciful, people would naturally think lightly of it and they would not be afraid to commit offenses. Compared to the other land, they were cutting the hand of the thieves. Since their crisis was how they harassed women, Fiona thought of emasculating them. 
but if it was a bad idea, she added an option of expelling them beyond the fourth rampant where the demonic monsters live. The murmurs of the people never end until they arrive at the town square, seems like the people were highly doubting the decision of the duke to have her as his deputy. Sigrun could not stop himself from being infuriated by seeing how the people looked down on her, but Fiona just urged her to calm down. She knew that getting mad would not help them to resolve their problem. Suddenly a woman named Charlotte hurriedly came to Fiona. She expressed how worried she was for the little girl who was assigned to handle this terrible situation in their town. The deputy of the duke just thanked the concern she had shown, but she continued proceeding to her mission. The mercenaries were trying to resist the soldiers who were arresting them. Their claims were as if the residents of the town owed them their lives after saving them from the monsters. When Fiona saw them, she could sense the strength they had since three soldiers of each were not enough to turn them down. One of them noticed the kids as he mocked the presence of the young boy he assaulted. The people before her were the ones who extorted, assaulted, and harassed people, but not to the extent of murder. Fiona revealed to them that Duke Abel Halon ordered her to handle them. But the bold mercenary just exclaimed his opposition to her authority of ordering him. He was so full of himself as they thought that the people were being ungrateful after they saved them from the monsters. Fiona knew that arguing with them would not make any sense, so she decided to use her power to threaten them. The mercenaries were afraid upon seeing how a little girl could cast her magic against them which made them shut their mouth and tremble in fear. As she made the mercenaries calm, she proceeded to state their offenses. While handling the mercenaries, the people who witnessed what she did were surprised, particularly Sigrun. It was finally proven in front of his sight that she was a real mage. She was nothing like the mages he had seen before. Most of them could make a fist-sized fireball, but Fiona was the only one he saw who could make a phenomenon caliber. He finally understood why the duke was keeping her and entrusted this problem to her in his stead. How a little girl stands bravely in front of those muscular men would leave a very strong impression on the people. This day will be fixated in their mind that Fiona is not just an ordinary girl. This would probably spread rumors about her. More importantly, she was receiving better treatment from the people of Halon Castle. He felt like there was something in her that the Duke needed to give her a convenient life. Fiona presented two options for the mercenaries to choose from. Either they would leave the town without bringing any weapons or supplies, or cutting off their private parts. The mercenaries exclaimed why they should not do any business with the savage and ignorant northerners. He added again of how they protected the town from the monsters, but Fiona defended that the duke paid them handsomely for the risks they took. Moreover, the mercenaries could also salvage some resources from those demonic creatures which could cost lavishly. Both parties could benefit from each other where the duke needed manpower to protect his realm, while the mercenaries would gain money from this job. Since they could not decide, the little girl volunteered to choose for them. Suddenly, she felt chill in the place and noticed the silence of the people. It became clear to her when she heard Abel speak behind her. The presence of this man could naturally bring a chill to the people around him. Duke Abel Halon came with Geron. He effortlessly lifted the little girl as he asked her decision about the perpetrators. Fiona asked first about how much of their conversation he overheard. So, he answered from how the mercenaries insulted the northerners. She repeated the choices, and he liked both ideas which made him question why she was letting them choose. She said that it was her way of showing mercy to them, but Abel claimed that there was no mercy living in them anymore, which made them tremble in fear. He began to walk closer to the bold man as he granted his claim about the northerners. He savagely kicked the most sensitive part of the male. Just like how he started, he commanded the soldiers to emasculate the mercenaries before throwing them beyond the fourth rampart. While Geron was building a snowman with the two kids, he informed Fiona that the duke had come all the way there because he was worried about her. Because of the changes he saw from the duke, it made him sarcastically claim that the end of the world was about to come. Duke Abel might be brutal sometimes, but he assured her that he came there because he was concerned about her. It seemed like it was not his intention to give her that kind of order, to begin with. 
Fiona could not believe that he did not come to check if she was doing well in her job. Geron added that the Duke entrusted her with that task because he knew that she was capable of doing it. So, he suggested that she should be more confident about herself. Later on, he decided to leave to get them some water. She must have known the truth from Geron, but she did not let herself be bothered by that thought as she focused on playing with Sigrun. While she was busy building their snowman, Sigrun inquired about her plan after leaving their place. She answered that she would just continue living as she is. Even though he was ashamed to ask, the boy requested her to visit him. Fiona was taken aback, which made Sigrun take back his words immediately. He assumed that she was just being nice to him out of pity. Because of that, Fiona held his hand as she promised that she would visit him every day, and his claim was not true. She even insisted on coming often since she was the one who wanted to initiate friendship with him. It took a while before Sigrun replied to her when she assured him that she would surely come to see him. Fiona understands if her friend cannot come to see her due to the restrictions in the castle, but Sigrun promises that he will do his best to be able to visit her someday. Halon Castle is not a place where people can freely come and go, so she thought that her friend was planning to rise through the ranks in order to visit her someday. Sigrun thought that Fiona would not believe in him because he was just an orphan kid with nothing in his name. But Fiona believed that he would do everything where his efforts would be significantly rewarded. Since she was the author of this story, she knew that Sigrun would be successful in life, aside from gaining wealth, prestige, and power, he would live a happy life with a woman who could heal his wounded heart. She promised to help him achieve his ambitions in life, as she also sworn to do that from the very moment that she saw his scars. Since that day when they built a snowman together, they became very good friends. After five years, the kid was already 18 years old. Fiona is currently shivering in the cold of the castle. She regretted making Halon a cold place as she could not still handle the bitter coldness of it. A new recruit was advising Fiona not to let her guard down as he assumed that the mage was not focused on the battle. But she assured him that she was quite focused while attacking the beast behind them and returning the advice to him. That terrified the newcomer so Fiona gave a little comfort that she would prevent any casualties from happening and told him that as long as they work together, they will be fine. Those words got the heart of the man, but before he could get close to their mage, a slayed head of monsters dropped in front of him by Sigrun, which made the efforts of Fiona to cheer him up became useless. The 19-year-old Sigrun just made an excuse to his friend that the newcomer was getting in the way. Fiona noticed that her friend grew up to be a tough guy who's not afraid of blood anymore, which she thought that it suited him. But sometimes he was acting like he was still going through puberty. Fiona told Sigrun to apologize to the new recruit as he frightened him, but he reasoned that it wouldn't help them if they would easily get shaken up by trivial things like that. He even scared them more while telling them that it was just only the beginning of their training. Before the new recruits got their spirits down, Fiona shared that she was like them when she first started to go to the battlefield so she knew that they would also do great just like her. The young man blushed at their mage's words, but Sigrun got irritated just by looking at him while Fiona was annoyed at his friend's reaction and thought he was becoming more and more like Abel. It has been five years since Fiona came to Halon, meaning, the time that the original story began was nearing. Currently, Sigrun kept his childhood promise over the years while learning swordsmanship from Abel. That training made him reach the position where he could freely come in and out of Halon Castle. Everyone also acknowledged his strength, so no one dared to mistreat him. As for Fiona, she was living the peaceful life that she wanted while receiving the rewards for protecting the ramparts so she no longer had to worry about money. All that was left for her to do was to make sure that Sigrun and the female lead of her novel met to get married and live happily ever after. But there was one hindrance to her plans, and that was Duke Abel was persuading her to accept his proposal to become his adopted daughter. Fiona firmly refused his offer since she already planned her life ever since she first arrived in Halon. The Duke didn't give up yet and said that everything Halon had could be hers including status, power, wealth, and prestige. As long as she became his successor, she will never want for more. 
The Duke was persistent, but Fiona was hard as a rock, so Abel didn't push it anymore and just complimented her for working hard the past five years. He thanked her for it, but Fiona thought that maybe he was critically ill as he was not in his usual self. Even Abel was feeling awkward saying such words, but he told her to just listen to him. He added that Halon has become more stable ever since Fiona chose to fight demonic beasts at a very young age, and they also gained strong knights, like Seagrin. What he was trying to say was, that if Fiona wished to leave Halon, she could do it whenever she wanted now. Her magic skills could help her to enjoy her life with great fame and fortune in the capital. If she worried about being called an illegitimate child, the Duke could do something for it so no one would dare to disrespect her. Fiona did not expect that he would be considerate of her, the Duke added that he was just giving her the reward she deserved. She teased him for being kind as he tried to insist that it was his payment for her service. Even though the Duke tried to deny it, she still saw kindness in him which made her regretful for calling him a cold heartless person. Suddenly, Duke Abel handed her the letter from her family. She suddenly remembered how the Green family pushed her to the battlefield when she was just a kid. Since that day, they never sent a single letter to contact her, so she wondered why she had received one now. The Duke urged her to open it to know the reason. He added that he could turn down the House of Green for sending her to the battleground against her will if she wanted to. Besides, he also had years of wrongdoings, he discovered in that family. But Fiona corrected that she was not mad at her family. The original story was about to start. The female lead will be making her entrance soon. However, things will be complicated if she gets closer to Seagrin. Fiona thanked the Duke for his kindness. In order to express her gratitude, Duke Abel wanted her to call him father, but she just refused. As she finished reading the letter, she informed him that her family wanted to have her death certificate. According to the letter, her father, Count Green, is currently suffering from a critical health condition. Therefore, it was their time to settle the matters regarding the inheritance so the other members of the Green family wanted to know if Fiona had already died. They knew how dangerous the situation she had been to think that it was impossible for her to survive. Five years ago, she had been an eyesore to the family, so they sent her out. Since then, she had been forgotten and now they only remembered her, because of the inheritance. She has no interest in getting her portion of their inheritance at all. She does not want to attend the burial of the Count either. What was just ironic was it happened exactly as Abel was letting her do what she wanted. There was no way that a Green family would not find out that she was still alive since they would never receive her death certificate. And they would surely bother her if that happened. It made her wonder if she would just sign a waiver to proclaim that she was giving up her portion of the inheritance. Even though Abel said that he could make them pay for what they did, she did not want to waste herself on something that happened five years ago. Besides, they were nobles whom she could not kill or hurt which would lead her to be imprisoned. The only way to peacefully handle this situation is to completely cut her connection with the Green family. However, she needs to go to the manor of their family first to settle it. While she was thinking deeply, the adult Sigurd came to see her. She invited him into her room, but he refused. As they become older, he starts to become distant from the girl. He told her that Abel informed him what happened. Hearing him addressing the Duke by his only name, she scolded him to show some respect since he was his teacher. Sigrin listened to her as he continued what he found out. He was told that she would be leaving soon. Fiona explained that her father was in a critical condition, so she must go to the capital where they live. He inquired if she would return right after her father died and she answered that she planned to stroll around the capital. For a girl who spent her years in the Halon Castle, it was a nice idea to go somewhere. He was eager to know her return so he asked her again. But Fiona answered that she was not planning to return because there was no reason for her to stay there anymore. They had been friends for five years, and she became his protector. And now, there is nothing she can do for him since the significant events of the novel in this story are about to begin. Sigrin initiated to talk inside her room as he let his frustration show. He complained about how she made decisions without even inquiring about it to him. 
He wanted to blame the Duke for giving her freedom to do what she wanted. It was like the five years they spent together were just nothing to her. Fiona tries to assure him that she will write whenever she can to him. But Segrin insisted that it was not the matter he was trying to point out. Judging from his emotion, Fiona could see that Segrin was thinking that they would live together forever. She made him understand that as people reached their adult age, no matter how valuable their friends are, the time will come when they must separate from each other. Segrin looked away as he asked her plan in the capital. Fiona was uncertain yet she wanted to go to the warmer place. Seeing his sad reaction made her explain that they were not kids anymore. His emotion was like showing he was thinking of spending the rest of their lives together, and she understood why he was reacting that way. The capital was his hometown, but it was also the place he needed to escape from, because that was the place where the people wanted to take his life lives. Time would come, if the story aligned to its supposed events, Segrin would come to the capital. She convinced him to not be sad anymore, as she assured him that she would be there if he ever needed her. But when Segrin asked if she could stay with him forever, Fiona claimed that there was an exception. If she stayed by his side, the story she made would not have progressed. When he asked what his place to her was, she answered that he was the most important person. He also inquired what she would do if he went to some places. As his friend, Fiona just wished him all the best. It was like a wrong decision to ask her those kinds of questions. Fiona started getting chills on her body as she tried to look for a blanket. While looking, she suddenly felt Segrin embracing her from behind. Even though it felt strange, she could feel how she was being locked in his arms. Segrin finally accepts that she will be leaving. While embracing her, he requested her to stay in the capital where he could follow her. Hearing his promise reminded her how the little boy promised to visit her. Now, the man behind her wanted her to wait for him in the capital. Months had already passed, many people had come to see her before she left. The duke was beside her, and he noticed that among the people, Segrin was not there. Even though he was not there, Fiona was certain that he was the most disappointed about her decision. When the duke asked if his student said anything else, Fiona answered that he would come and find her. Her answer did not even surprise Abel, as he already expected that. Suddenly, he handed her a letter that would give her the authority to live at the Halon Manor, in the capital, if she wanted to. She thanked him for everything he had done for her. As her carriage started moving out, she bid goodbye to the maids. Not in the distance, she saw Abel watch her leave while saying something. As Fiona tried to read his mouth, she understood that he was trying to say that they were going to meet again. That was when she left Halon and started her journey going to the capital. At the manor of the Green family, the sons of the Count were arguing about the inheritance. According to the doctor, there was no chance that Count Green would regain his consciousness. But the biggest problem for them was their father did not have a chance to write a formal will before he fell into his illness. As the eldest son, Kingdale thought that he had the right to decide for their fortune, but the second son, Zen, opposed his words as he claimed that no one would agree that the eldest child alone should carry the name of their family. Since the house green was known for a family of mages, it would be better to leave it to the hand of the skillful in magic. Kingdell was offended, which made Zen highlight that he could only do circus magic, such as making fireballs. They are so loud that their mother can hear them from the other side of the door. Countess Green entered to stop her sons from arguing like a petty child. As the lady of the house, she proclaims that she will handle the matters regarding the inheritance so they will not argue anymore. But Zen revealed that they could not leave that responsibility to her because they were aware of her hidden lover. How she showered that person with money made them worried that the entire fortune of their family would fall into her secret lover. Countess Green was infuriated as they revealed her secret but her sons do not care about whom she is having an affair with. While they are bickering, their servant announces that they have a visitor. They were all surprised to know that the visitor he was referring to was Miss Fiona Green. They could not believe that she was still alive after sending off to the battle. Zen assumed that it was an imposter since it would be impossible for a 13-year-old to survive. He believed that she could not even cast any spells to save herself. 
Fiona Green was the illegitimate child who was brought in by Count Green who locked her in the attic. She was the child who was thrown into the battlefield by her family to make it look like they were obeying the imperial order. The countess immediately ordered the servant to send their visitor away. But Fiona still managed to enter and show herself in front of her family. She reasoned that she came all the way there after receiving their letter asking for her death certificate. Each of them was in shock while she was telling how happy she was to see them without making any changes. The next morning, she woke up in the estate of the Green. Fortunately, her family had given her a nice room, so she had a comfortable sleep last night. If they put her in the attic again, she will probably complain about it. She remembered their reaction when they saw her. It seemed like she interrupted their fights over the inheritance. Moreover, she was just planning to sign away her inheritance and leave immediately because she did not want to be involved in this matter. Later on, a maid came to bring her the basin of water where she could wash her face. The maid immediately put the basin and she did not even notice some water spilled due to her hurriedness. When Fiona looked into the water, regardless of its strange odor, she noticed that it was a dirty mop of water. Fiona Green was insulted after the maid gave her a basin of dirty water. After all the hard work she paid off on the battlefield to keep the peace in their homeland, how could they treat her rudely in return? The way the servant tries to hold her laughter after seeing her reaction caught her attention. She recognized that evil maid, she was one of the people in that house who made her life harder for being an illegitimate child. From that point, she realized that even though they let her sleep comfortably in a nice room unlike before, how the servant had the audacity to treat her disrespectfully means that the Green family still viewed her as a worthless bastard. Nothing had changed, they still see her as a poor and powerless 13-year-old child who only has a half-right to their family name. The way they welcomed her just now aroused her desire for revenge, not because she was offended, but because of everything that Fiona had to endure because of them. Fiona Green asked the name of the insolent maid, and she boldly answered her name as May. The way she could look straight into her eyes reflects her connection to her master in the house. Usually, the noble households never let servants look at their masters that way. But seeing in her eyes, she must think that she was allowed to do that because she had the favor of the countess. The lady of the house had despised her from the very beginning and she was certain that they would hate her more after showing up during the problem with their inheritance. The entire family might be worried by now that the illegitimate child could have a single gemstone from their possessions. The maid wanted to make sure that the unwanted visitor understood her place in this household. For her, she was still the immature little girl that just came to her age. She might be lucky to come back alive, but she could not let her mooch off the Green family again. Since the countess wanted to see her running away while crying, this would be her chance to strengthen the trust she gained from the countess. She would let her feel that she was unwelcome and never been accepted to stay in this household. Fiona stated that she could read her intention, so she pretended like her action made her cry. While the servant watched the lady cry, she was taken aback when Fiona suddenly slapped her. She could not believe that a powerless child who used to crawl on the floors of the mansion dared to hurt her. Fiona smiled after doing it as she stated that she was glad that nothing had changed in this place. The servant just yelled at her out of frustration. But the bastard child they knew just asked her about the wrong thing she did. She might be smiling, but she strangely made her feel terrified. May swore that she would make her regret doing it right after she reported her to the countess. But Fiona did not let her go by slapping her and asked her the same question again about what she just intentionally brought to her. When the servant was about to answer, she suddenly groaned in pain again after Fiona madly hit her until she stumbled on the floor. She could not believe that the weak child she used to harass before could now lay her hands to hurt her. Fiona leaned closer to her while calmly demanding an answer from her. The servant was even terrified to say a word. Since she could not have her words, Fiona offered to talk with her like how they do in Halon. It sent shivers to the servant when she mentioned that in Halon, they cut the tongue of the impudent servants as their punishment. When she threatened her to cut her tongue instead, May begged her forgiveness. Fiona asked her who she was while caressing her face. 
It made the servant cry hard, showing her fear while answering that she was Lady Fiona of the House Green. Hearing how she stated her name as a part of the noble family she was serving, Fiona inquired how she must treat her. The servant could not admit the intentional disrespect she did to her, so she just swore that she would never act out of the line again while wailing for forgiveness. It seemed that it was already enough to make the servant realize who she was as she turned her back. May thought she was already spared, so she immediately stood to report it to the countess, who would certainly make the lady pay for what she did. But before she could run away, the cold rug water splashed all over her body. She was stunned when she saw that it was Lady Fiona, and she commanded her to take the empty basin. Before letting the servant go, she warned her again that if she repeated disrespecting her, she would make her pay the way she deserved. Fiona indeed lost her temper, because of the insolent maid. But upon admitting it to herself, she randomly remembered Seagrin telling her that she had a temper. He might be right, however, the people in this house were really testing her. She just decided to walk around the house, when she suddenly heard the countess talking about how she could roam freely. Fiona defended herself that it was not a problem to do that in her own house. The countess mocked her when she heard her thinking that it was actually her house. Hearing her made her want to slap her too, but she managed to keep herself calm. As the countess ascended the stairs, her mouth did not stop insulting her. While Fiona was trying to calm herself, she then realized that it must not be her to be the one who would always endure and hold back. They were the ones who started everything, and she had been keeping her patience. Growing up in Halon, a major part of the fighting was to face the opponent directly. However, in this case, fighting back would only cause her a lot of work and would make her stay longer. From that moment, she already made a decision, she would never hold back anymore. The countess halted when she heard Fiona thanking her after she finally had the courage to do things right because of her. The main reason why she wanted to give up her inheritance was because she wanted to cut her ties with the Green family completely. However, after the countess and her servant did, it gave clarity to what she must do. Fiona assured the lady of the house that she had no interest even in a single jewel in their household. However, she did not mention that she would not let them take anything either as she wanted to bring their greed and selfishness out of themselves. If that happened, she wanted to see their gradual desperation after she boldly took away everything in front of them. Her words might be a sound of assurance, but even seeing her smile did not bring relief to the countess. That day, Fiona sent a concise letter to Abel, where she was priorly requesting the severance he mentioned to her before. At Halon, Abel already received her letter, and he did not expect that she would be asking for it so soon. Fiona Green was indeed unpredictable ever since she was a kid, she was sometimes sweet and kind, while the other times, cold and conclusive. He thought that Fiona would love their place after she dedicated her life to protecting Halon. But when he told her to leave, she left without even looking back. It turned out to be disappointing, which made him wonder how this decision affected Seagrin. For five years, Fiona cared for him to such an extent where people thought she was secretly in love with him. But when she left Halon, as well as Seagrin, it seemed like she was implying that her work in this place had already been done. One thing about her that Abel never understands is that Fiona never lets herself be constrained by any societal ties or personal relationships. Later on, he heard Seagrin knock on his door, who mistakenly called him by his only name. He immediately apologized for it as their master let him in. According to him, he came as soon as he heard that he wanted to talk to him. Abel handed him the letter of Fiona and added that he would teach him another lesson. Seagrin read a letter and commended how she directly conveyed her point. The master teased him if he was upset for not reading something about him in the letter. For Seagrin, it does not matter to him anymore, because he will eventually follow her to the capital. Abel reminded him that his relationship with the Imperial was not in a good state and he was well aware that Seagrin was the illegitimate son of the Emperor. They had already talked about it years ago, and the young Seagrin could not answer his question about his chance to be officially recognized as the imperial prince. He admits that he was confused upon choosing between revenge, life, and peace. But now, Abel could see that he already decided what to choose. 
however, it was not an easy thing. As an illegitimate son of the emperor, with nothing in his name, he must accomplish a great victory first, before returning to the capital. He needed something that could ignite the hearts of the people and mark in their minds that he was the imperial prince. Abel provided an example. He could slay a master beast of a barren part of the Halon, which could result in him as the prince who saved the entire village. If he could take his advice, he would help him to regain his position in the empire. That was what Fiona wished him to be, because she knew that his fate was to become a hero. Abel sent a letter back to Fiona. He would grant her request in exchange to come and check the Halon estate when she finished her work in the capital. Upon reading it, she felt relief when he did not mention about calling him her father. Fiona strictly refused that request not because she hated Abel, but because they were enemies in the original story. However, the expected terror Abel turned to be soft to her and wanted her to become his daughter. Coming back is a nice idea to relax so, she would definitely do that once her job is done. They were now getting closer to the original event of the story where Abel and Sigrun return to the capital, the emperor's illegitimate child will soon defeat the cursed dragon of the north, making him a hero when he returns to the city. As a result, the imperial family will choose to acknowledge him as a prince in light of popular opinion and their own reputation. Fiona was looking forward to seeing Eunice, the heroine, who will be introduced after that. However, she was concerned about the possible outcome of the novel, because the male lead, Sigrun, had been very attached to her. It is one of the factors she must worry about. And there was still one thing which was more important to carry out. Fiona had to devise a strategy to take advantage of the Green families associated with drug business ties, where they gained massive profit. Anything connected to these kinds of transactions was forbidden under the empire. If someone is found to be distributing narcotics, their products will be confiscated, and the offenders along with their families will face persecution. However, it appears that the Countess and Zen are unaware of the family's involvement in the drug trade. Upon thinking of what she must do, Fiona decided to start everything with someone who was already cornered. At the library, Zen was startled when he saw Fiona. He scoffed when she said that there was something she needed to say regarding the succession of their family. As for someone they see as the bastard of the family, he does not think that she had the right to say something about that matter. He was halted when Fiona said that she wanted him to be the successor of their family. Since House Green is a family of mages, it is necessary to give the position to the best one. However, King Dell was the expected one to obtain the position because he was the eldest son. Truthfully, both sons were flawed. According to Abel, Zen was drowned in debt due to gambling. It would be expected that he would use the wealth of their family to pay all his creditors. But before she left the Halon, Abel had already settled his debts and granted her the right of disposition, which she was keeping as a secret. Zen thought that everything she had said was right as he claimed that they could not let Kane Dell, who was incompetent enough take on the name of their family. But the fact that their eldest brother had been the successor, for a very long time, this would not be easy. Later on, Fiona showed something she got from the room, Kandel covered with a small red pocket. Zen was astounded to see that it contained drugs inside. According to Fiona, the servants found it yesterday in his room. She acted like she had been very worried and disappointed that the successor of the family had this kind of addiction. For Zen, he could use this to defeat their eldest brother. He asked the name of the servant, but before Fiona could answer him, he requested him something first. Fiona asked him to remove her name from their family registry once he inherit the position of the count. That was her reason to return to the capital, it was totally opposite from what others think that she came back for the inheritance. She claimed that she only wanted to see her family, but then, she was already tired of being called a bastard and being misunderstood. More importantly, she admitted that her existence was just a burden to this household. After hearing her side and seeing how she shed a tear Zen swore that he would set her free once he became the head of their family. But in the back of Fiona's mind, he was the one who sent her to the battlefield for her demise. At the end of their conversation, Fiona revealed the servant who found the drug in Kandel's room. But the truth is, saying that the substance was accidentally found was a lie. 
she actually bribed a servant to search the room of their eldest brother. The bribed servants would report to Zen that they had just discovered the drug by accident while cleaning Kendall's room and they just coincidentally saw Fiona walk in during their discovery. This will lead to terrible arguments amongst the sons of the deceased Count. Their conflicts have been growing increasingly violent. Due to their endless arguments, the Countess seldom visited them at the estate because she was already sick of the situation in their home. As the days passed, Zen started spreading fabricated rumors about Kandel. As the rumors gained attraction, the family began questioning Kandel's rights to the family name. Soon after, the eldest son was arrested and disowned by his own family. She will now implement her next plan after putting an end to her brother's fight. She had been keeping an envelope that held a letter detailing the Green family's illegal activities. She intended to transmit it to the Treasury Department of the Imperial Court. Now was her chance to show the last piece that would turn down the entire family that had mistreated her. In the following days, it had not been long since Abel sent her a letter again asking if she had not finished her job yet in the capital. It seemed that he did not realize how difficult it was to bring down an aristocratic family. She just recently sent an anonymous letter to the Imperial Treasury which indicates the illegal activities of the Green family. Once the contents of the letter are verified as accurate, the fortune of the Green family will be confiscated. Given the extraordinary wealth of that aristocratic family, Fiona was confident the Imperial Court would view it as a favorable opportunity to increase the National Treasury. Two days later, Fiona went to the office of the newly reigned successor of their family. Even though it was not confirmed yet, she congratulated Zen for having a high chance to become the heir of their inheritance. Since there was no other person who would dare to compete with him for the position, he supposed that Fiona was right about it. Later on, Fiona presented the document as a part of their deal. In order to remove her name from the family, she just needs Zen's stamp on it. Her brother did it right away and urged her to leave since he still had a lot of work to do. But before Fiona left, there was one thing she needed to say to him. While smirking, she uttered that his addiction to gambling was incurable, particularly when he was heavily in debt. Zen was surprised when she revealed that she was aware of his secret, but his sister just left even when he called her again. While walking through the hallway, she saw the countess on her way with the maid named May. They were glaring at her after seeing the person they despised the most. The countess was infuriated when she saw Fiona, so she shouted for her to leave their estate and stop bothering her brother anymore. She was indeed on her way out to the place that made her little life a living hell. But in order to satisfy herself, there was one thing she needed to do with the lady of the house first. The countess was astounded as she stumbled on the ground after Fiona slapped her hard. She stated that the eldest son had been kicked out, while Zen would live in debt forever, and now, she could not leave without slapping the countess on her face. Her stepmother was surprised about the thing she said about Zen. Because of that, she got even more frustrated and told the staff to lock Fiona up. But suddenly, another servant rushed to her and reported the bad news. Under the imperial order, there were imperial guards who came to their estates. Fiona did not expect that they would come sooner than she anticipated. To make the Countess understand what was happening, she revealed the illegal involvement of her husband and Kandel in the drug sales, which she exposed to the Imperial Court. She was certain that the Countess clearly knew what would happen to them. After they confirm the illegal dealings of the Green family, their entire fortune will be confiscated by the National Treasury. The Countess was still hoping that she was lying because she was certain that Fiona would be punished along with them if she was telling the truth. But the unwanted child showed her a document with a stamp of Zen that she was no longer part of their family. That means, she has no responsibility for whatever happened to them in this crisis. Truthfully, Fiona would not go to this extent because she believed she might have played some part in this whole thing. However, she was reluctant to get emotionally involved since she felt she might be somewhat at fault. She would like to ask for forgiveness if only she could meet the original Fiona. But after giving it some more time to think, she concluded that this was something she should have done five years ago. 
Fiona fetched the jewel that dropped due to the impactful slap she gave to the countess and reminded her to be careful with those kinds of things because she might never get to own something like it again. The imperial knights barged into their mansion and declared that they had received a report regarding their involvement in an illegal business. Because of that, they were given an imperial order to freeze the accounts of the family. As Fiona commended in her mind how the treasury does well in their job, it reminded her of the character in that field who loves money. After this job, she needed to plan her way back to the Halon estate. On the other hand, in the forest, Seagrin recently executed the most terrifying beast he had ever encountered. It makes sense that this was regarded as the supreme in the northern range after the tough battle. While resting after he slayed the top predator, Abel came and congratulated him. When he inquired about his feelings after completing his task, Seagrin simply answered that he had no particular special feelings about it. In order to return to the capital as an officially authorized prince of the empire, he must at least pull off a major achievement first. That was the reason why he executed the great beast, but he never felt any satisfaction about it. However, this means he can finally return to the hometown of the killer of his mother. More importantly, he can go to the location of Fiona. But Seagrin claimed that he was uncertain if Fiona remained in the capital when she boldly mentioned how much she wanted to travel. He thought that his student might need his assistance, so he prepared the most powerful weapon at the estate. But when he saw his job was already done, he decided to return to take care of their warriors. After his teacher departed, Seagram pondered over his remarks to Fiona. That woman was hard to define as the wind. He remembered how she would always assure him that she would never cause him any pain as she declared his success someday. There was only one thing he wanted, but in order to get it, he had a lot of things to achieve. When he took a glance at the lifeless dragon, he saw the heart that he certainly thought was enough to have the attention of the numerous ladies. With the thought of making Fiona wait for him, he took off the dragon's heart. At the Halon's mansion in the capital, Fiona was amazed to see how more beautiful it was compared to the frightening castle she used to live in. She enjoyed looking at the scenery as she walked in. She observed that the training ground and the outside were kept up nicely. The garden is blooming with seasonal flowers. From the outside, the views appear flawless throughout. She was so taken aback by the gorgeous garden that she almost thanked the gardeners for all of their hard work. But she stopped herself, fearing that people might assume she was there to simply inspect them out. She didn't anticipate receiving kind service from the staff, and she didn't want to spend a lot of time in an uncomfortable environment either. Fiona expected that the housekeeper would be aware of her presence since she had previously informed the doorman of the reason for her visit. But when she entered the main door, it turned out opposite of what she expected. The housekeeper greeted her and to her surprise, all of the servants were lined up to warmly welcome her arrival to the Halon estate. Thinking that the guest must be tired in her travel, they took her to the room they had prepared for her. Fiona was surprised to see how they provided a luxurious executive suite for her. The food was also served like she was in a prestige restaurant. It felt so good to be in that place as she happily ate her favorite meal. Later on, she told Celine that she came there because their master ordered her to look around the estate. The housekeeper claimed that she made sure that everything was already prepared, and she could escort her right after she ate. Just as they planned, they went to the main areas of the estate. When they went to the library, Celine showed her the lodger where the expenses of the estate were listed. It was quite thick, but Fiona still read them page by page. She did not see anything to report negatively. Upon reading, she realized that she needed to be extra careful since embezzlement is common in a case like this. When she looked in front of her, she realized how drowned she was with the tower of books she must read. Looks like it will take her months for her to finish everything. It made her wonder if Abel sent her there, because he was too lazy to read all of them by himself. Originally, Abel wanted her to stay in his estate. The life of Fiona there turned out like she was living the life of royalty where every servant gave and did everything for her. It seemed like the only thing left was a crown to complete her beautiful dress and accessories like a princess. It was too good to be true which made her wonder how she ended up in that moment of her life. 
It was already the day when the entire capital was celebrating the flower festival, Fiona was amazed at the multitude of people participating in this yearly event. According to Celine, the said festival is one of the highlights in the capital. Ever since she came to the estate of Halon, she spent her time working. One day, while the housekeeper was serving her snacks, she mentioned the perfect time to go to see flowers. The old woman used to attend the flower festival with her granddaughter, who was around the age of the lady. However, she could not go with her by this time and she kept thinking about her, especially during this season. It looks like Celine wants to invite Fiona, so she just agrees with her. After hearing her story, there was no way that she could reject her. Fiona stayed in the park, which according to Celine, was only exclusive for the nobles. Fiona felt relaxed with the silence of the environment. There were other nobles in the park, but none of them ruined the peaceful ambience of it. This place was totally opposite to Heilan, which was surrounded by the shivering coldness of the battlefield. Fiona leaned on the railings as she let herself think about things. Whenever she had time in her most tranquil moments of reflection, she could not resist wondering at how implausible the universe she had just constructed, the people who inhabited it. And the fate she had written for them, a fate that involves events that follow a predetermined timeline. Considering that all she did was write the story, the leading male and female characters, and the major events that surround them, it is difficult to understand the universe within the novel without actually seeing the characters in person. When she thought about the supporting characters she made, she was surprised that she only made ten characters, which was fewer for the vast world she created. Upon contemplating as she strode around, she accidentally hit a person. The man immediately asked if she was fine, and she was astonished as she responded to apologize to him. The man appears to be in his early to mid-twenties, he is well-groomed, courteous, and well-dressed. He looks to be a person of great rank. He also has golden eyes and vivid red hair. Unquestionably, the man smiling at her was incredibly attractive. Given the attractiveness of both the male lead and the male supporting character in the novel, the man who stood before her had to be a significant figure as well. However, she could not remember writing about him. She avoided his gaze when the man asked her once again. From a distance, she saw a tie clip, which she assumed belonged to him, and made him drop after they bumped into each other. Fiona was going to reach it for him, but as her fingertip lay on that clip, she felt a sudden strange feeling. The man reached the clip on his own and claimed that it was a magic stone. A magic stone is a tool used by laypersons, or mages, who possess unstable magical abilities. It responds to the touch of a maid. She doesn't need to use any of it since her magic is already strong. When the man noticed the reaction of the stone to her, he concluded that she was an incredible mage. The man noticed that the stone was brilliantly blazing red in her presence which was, truthfully, it was written in this novel that it would react that way to match the power of the mage around. Later on, she decided to excuse herself to leave, but the man halted him and introduced her name as Arendt Clovis. That made her remember the character she made about him. When he asked about her name, Fiona chose to hide her real identity and claimed that her name was Celine. They shortly greeted each other after knowing each other. As Fiona left, she could blame her forgetfulness on the ledgers that had been occupying her mind. Just like what she anticipated earlier, the man was an important figure in the story because he works in the national treasury which she randomly thought about. Arendt Clovis had a figure of being a bad guy and an opportunist, a supporting male character who would always act facade sweet and well-mannered in front of Eunice, the female lead. Now that she is living as an incarnation of Fiona, that man will be the main reason why the character she lived on will become the final boss in the original story. The reason why Fiona became the final boss was because of her inability to control the power she had acquired through a dark agreement. The primary person who indulged her in this agreement was Arendt regardless of other objectives she had. Now that the author possessed the body of Fiona, she honestly had forgotten about the Marquis because she was too focused on Segrin. Arendt supposedly appears in the middle of the noble, so she does not expect to see him this early before the beginning of the original story. It seemed almost like a strange twist of fate that she should have run across him out of all the people in the capital. 
Arendt Clovis is the classic villain, an opportunist. While treating everyone else like trash, he was being gentlemanly to the female lead, whom he loves. Fiona couldn't help but wonder what it would be like to deal with him in real life from a third-person perspective. She reasoned that it would be best to flee away from him and never look back. Despite his charming appearance, he has a mean spirit. Fiona intended to dispose of him before he could harm her if things went wrong. She might be able to carry on as the kind Fiona if she eliminated every character who led her to become the last boss first. On the other hand, the Marquis was left dumbfounded at the park after seeing her running away just like that. He was certain that she recognized him even though he did not state his title. Well, he was already used to it since he was quite famous among the social nobility in the capital. However, the way she coldly looked at him was unusual when ladies used to admire how attractive he was. Moreover, it is also evident that she must be an advanced-level mage, because her touch affected the magic stone. What makes her strange comes from the fact that someone possessing such a magical ability would undoubtedly be well-known in social circles, yet he was positive he had never seen her before. Arendt thought that the girl named Celine could be advantageous for his work so he desired to find her. At the Halon estate, Fiona was stressed out because of the endless books that she had to read. She wanted to confront him right away for passing to her the work he must do by himself. However, Abel and Segrin were expected to arrive at the capital around the time when the flowers in the festival started to wilt. It will take a month before that season to come. Later on, Celine knocked on her door and asked for a moment with the lady. Fiona followed her with the thought that it was also a perfect time to take a break from her work. That day, they went to the boutique and made the lady try the dress that was meant to be worn at the banquet. When Celine said that the dress was for the ball, she finally understood why she wanted her to do the fitting after all the dress they tried on. Furthermore, they were at the Marianne boutique, which the ladies of the nobility loved. Every noble lady would do anything to visit the place even a newly created dress would take months to make. Eunice, the main female character, regularly has her outfits made in that famous shop. Fiona recalled a time in this story when Arendt attempted to approach her since she looked so beautiful in the dress. Thinking about it, Fiona thought that things had taken an odd turn and that something did not feel quite right. Celine commented how beautiful she was while wearing the royal blue dress. While seeing her in that dress makes her think of her granddaughter, sadly, she would never see her in a dress again. Because of her words, Fiona was unable to jump to the conclusion that the housekeeper was the reason why she started to feel strange in this novel she created. After the fitting they may, Celine requested her to wait for her for a bit in a nearby coffee shop, because there were some things she needed to discuss with the staff of the boutique. Fiona waited at the coffee shop across the boutique while enjoying the refreshing cold water she would never dare to drink in Halon due to its decreasing temperature. It was a perfect change that she could now enjoy the warm temperature of the capital while having a cold drink. She did not regret coming out at all, not until someone approached her. It seemed that Marquis Clovis would always go to her whenever he saw her. Marquis Clovis greeted her and addressed her as Lady Celine. Upon hearing it, she clarified that she was not a noble, but the Marquis just questioned her being the patron of the Mariana boutique shop if she was not living her aristocratic life. Fiona inquired how he knew that she came from that famous shop, so he answered that he just saw her exit the place and immediately apologized if he happened to offend her. She just reasoned that she only came there for a friend. The Marquis decided to call her Miss Celine instead and asked permission if he could join her. Fiona knew that she could not refuse him after she stated that she was not a noble, so there was nothing she could do when he already sat in front of her. As she inquired if there was something she could do for her, Arendt wanted to offer her something if she did not want to work for the city as a mage. It was clear that he was interested in her power, just like what was supposed to happen in the novel. He was not revealing his offer yet, and Fiona politely refused it immediately. And no matter how many privileges and money he could offer, None of them caught her interest in working as a mage. Despite her refusal, Arendt still tried to convince her, but someone from behind said that he had no idea about her identity. Fiona was surprised to see Abel in the capital earlier than she expected. 
The two men recognized each other but seeing how they looked at each other made her uncomfortable. To have Abel's attention, she immediately asked his reason to come there. The duke answered that he just wanted to show her the dragon they just caught since he was aware that she had never seen one before. The way he said it, it sounded like he just brought a bucket of fried chicken for her. According to Abel, it was Seagrin who defeated the dragon. But before they could go there, he inquired about her business with the Marquis. Arendt answered that there was something important he was discussing with Miss Celine. Hearing how he called her in a different name made her look at her. Without saying a word, it looks like they understood each other. Abel tried to excuse Fiona, but Arendt could not just let her go, because he was eager to discuss with her more important things. The Marquis asked him about his relationship with the lady. Fiona, beside the Duke, was anxious that he might reveal that she was her former subordinate. But the Duke answered that she was his daughter. It was a better excuse than she was anxious about, but she felt betrayed about it when she refused to become his daughter before. Arendt noticed that she was also dumbfounded about it, but Abel claimed that he just recently adopted her. Now, they had enough reason to make the Marquis leave when the Duke said that he wanted to spend time with his daughter. But before he could leave completely, Arendt asked his real intention to come to the capital. Abel just subtly answered that he came there to end the winter. They were striding when Fiona heard that he wanted her to return to her job. Because of that, she clarified that she already did not just take a leave of absence, she entirely quit. But for Abel, they were just the same thing. Later on, the Duke told her to ignore the pest if she happened to see him again. With that advice, Fiona realized that it was Marquis Clovis who she was referring to as a pest. Suddenly, a man shouted after seeing something horrifying. People began to panic and run when they saw a giant beast. Because of that, Fiona alertly energized her magic to protect the people, but Abel halted her since there was nothing really to be worried about. A young boy urged everyone to calm down. Among the people in the capital, he was the first to recognize that it was harmless. The giant dragon was being pulled by the horses. Fiona was stunned to see Sigrun riding a carriage, who according to Abel, was the one who slayed the monster in order to follow her in the capital. For the time being, I'll end this here. Did you enjoy the manhwa? If so, then check back for part 4. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more.